This is a processing tutorial focused on something called the super formula. Now, my first favorite thing about the super formula is just the name. It has such a funny name, super formula. It sounds like it's going to be the best formula ever. Uh, but it actually is going to allow us to plot some really cool shapes. And by changing the parameters of the formula, we're going to be able to plot a wide variety of shapes. And furthermore, by changing the parameters over time, we can animate the super formula within processing in interesting ways. So the super formula looks like this. It's this big glob of math that we're going to get into later. And it's going to be our job to transform it into processing code. But the first thing we have to understand is that the super formula is written in terms of polar coordinates. So I'd like to review or introduce this idea of polar coordinates uh, by first contrasting it with Cartesian coordinates. So the Cartesian coordinate system is what we're used to thinking about when we think about points uh, on a two-dimensional plane. The points are of the form x, y. If we wanted to plot, for example, the point 2, 5, then we know we need to move uh, two units in the positive x direction along the x-axis, and then five units up, and there's our point at 2, 5. Polar coordinates are similar in that there's two values that make up the point, but this time the values have different names. We call them r and theta. r is the radial distance away from the origin, okay? And theta is, in terms of radians, it's an angle measurement up from the x-axis. So if we wanted to plot this point in terms of polar coordinates, 4 comma pi over 4 radians, first we measure up pi over 4 radians from the x-axis, then we extend that line by 4 units so that the point lands at a radial distance that is 4 units away from the origin. So it's just a different way of basically addressing uh, where these points sh should go in the 2D plane. Let's review functions for a second. So we can have functions in terms of Cartesian coordinates that look something like this. f of x is equal to 1. And if we plot this function, then it looks like this, with a line at y equals 1. So again, this function is in terms of x, and then it spits out values for y. We can also have a function in terms of polar coordinates, that looks like this. This function is in terms of theta. So we plug in angle values, and then we get out radial distances from the origin. So for this function, r of theta is equal to 1. If we plot it, it's a circle with a radius unit 1 about the origin. So you can tell that polar coordinates are going to be useful for drawing circle-like shapes, or shapes that have symmetry, as we'll see. Now, there's a problem, and that's that processing only allows us to draw in terms of Cartesian coordinates. All of the drawing functions in processing work in terms of Cartesian coordinates. So if we're going to use polar coordinates, we need to transform our polar coordinates into Cartesian coordinates. And luckily, that's not too hard. We just use these two formulas. So if I have a point in terms of polar coordinates, r, comma, theta, I just plug in the values for r and theta, into these formulas, and it will spit out the x and the y of our Cartesian coordinate point. So for example, if I had the polar coordinates 5, comma, pi over 3 radians, and I just plug those values into the formulas, and I get out 2.5 and 4.3, and there's my Cartesian coordinates. Let's move over to processing, and we're going to hold off on actually looking at the real super formula. We're going to start by just drawing a simpler function in terms of polar coordinates. So let's create a function called r, which has a single parameter theta. This is going to be our polar coordinate function. And for now, it's just going to return 1. Then we're going to write our processing setup function. Inside of here, let's uh, set the size to 500 by 500. Let's turn no fill on. We'll set the stroke color to white. And we'll set the stroke weight to 2 pixels. Then inside of our draw function, oops, we're going to set the background color to black. And our strategy here is we're going to be using processing's uh, concept of a shape. So we're going to first call the begin shape function. Then we're going to add some vertices, which we'll do in a second. And then we're going to call the end shape function. 
Now, how are we going to add these vertices? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to loop over various values of theta. So we're going to grab points along our function and plot them using the vertex function. So let's create a for loop. And we're going to start at theta equals 0. Notice that I've used a float type variable rather than an int, which you might be used to for for loops. Uh, we're going to loop as long as theta is less than 360 degrees. So we're just going to cover one full circle. Uh, and then remember that theta is in terms of radians. So we want to say theta is less than uh, 2 times pi. And then we're going to increment theta by a small interval every iteration in the loop. Now we need to actually compute a value of r for our given value of theta. So let's create a new variable called rad and set it equal to r of theta. So now we have our r value and our theta value, but remember we need to transform these into Cartesian coordinates before we can plot them. So let's just follow those formulas I showed you. We're going to set x equal to rad times cosine of theta. And then the formula for y is very similar. But instead of cosine, we have a sine. Now we have our x and y coordinates. And we can call the vertex function with x comma y. One last thing I'm going to do here is I want to scale up our plot of the function. Because if we look at our function right now, it's returning 1. And a radial distance of 1 is actually really small if we're thinking in terms of pixels. We will barely be able to see that. So let's scale this up by multiplying by a constant value of 50 for both the x and the y. And now we can run this. And we see we're drawing at least part of a circle up in the upper left hand corner because processing's origin is in the upper left hand corner. Well, we don't want that. We want the formula to be plotted in the center of the canvas. So to do that, before we draw our shape, let's call the translate function. And we want to translate to the center of the screen, which is at width over 2, comma, height over 2. Uh, and so now when we run this, we can see that our plot is centered. Our next step is to actually look at the super formula itself and to start to code it up in our R function here. If you're more mathematically inclined, you might be interested to look up the super formula on Wikipedia or some other source and read about the history of it, how it was developed, and how it relates to other similar formulas. We're not going to do any of that in this video. We're just going to blindly code it up in processing and start to play around with what the plot of it looks like as we change these parameters. Now you'll notice the function is in terms of theta, but it also has all these other constants. We have this a, b, m, n1, n2, and n3. And we're actually going to treat those in our processing code as additional parameters to the r function. So that's our first step. Let's add these parameters. We got a, b, m, n1, n2, and n3. Now, the next step is we're just going to take this piece by piece and write small chunks of the formula at a time. So let's start with this section here, cosine of m times theta over 4. That's what we're going to start with. So let's write that, uh, cosine of m times theta over 4. Now, we got to be careful here. If we divide by 4, then we're going to be using what's called integer division. And for a formula like this, where we're working with real decimal numbers, we want to avoid that. So let's actually write 4.0. Now, the next step is this slightly larger expression. So this is what we just wrote, cosine m theta over 4, divided by an a. Then we're going to take the absolute value of that and raise it to the power n2. So we're going to divide this by an a, take the absolute value with the processing abs function, and then we need to raise it to a power. So we use the pow function with this whole expression as our base. And then our exponent is n2. Great. Now, the second term here is very similar to this other term, but we just need to swap out sine for cosine b for a, and n3 for n2. So we can actually just copy and paste this whole thing. And we want to swap out sine for cosine, 
B for A, N3 for N2, and we're good. We're almost there. The last step to get the whole expression is we need to raise this expression in between the parentheses to the exponent uh, negative 1 over N1. So we're going to have another call to POW with that whole big thing as our base. And then our exponent is negative 1 over N1. And we can clean this up just a little bit because it's getting really long. And there we have it. That's our super formula in processing. We're so close to seeing our super formula in action, but there's one last step. We added all these additional parameters down in the definition of the R function, but we're not passing in corresponding parameters when we call R up here. So what values do we want to actually pass in? Well, we don't know what these parameters do just yet, and so I'm just going to show you some parameters that I've selected to start with. I've commented which parameter each value is so we can keep track of these big list of parameters. We're going to pass in 1 for a and b, 0 for m, and then 1 for n1, n2, and n3. So we can actually run this now finally and we can see what our super formula looks like. It's just a circle. Great. Uh, you can see also that the circle has a little space here and the edge of the circle is a little bit jaggedy, and that has to do with our increment value that we're adding to theta each iteration of our loop. This determines the resolution of our plot. If we decrease this increment value, then we increase the resolution of our plot, and you can see now that I've decreased it, the circle is much more smooth and there's no gap. So what I've done is I've given you the parameter values for the super formula to draw a circle. And this is a good starting place. We can start to play around with changing these parameter values by using processing's mouse x and mouse y variables. So let me show you how this works. We can use this mouse x to see how, as we increase and decrease a, the plot of the super formula changes. So it looks like as a gets bigger, this circle gets bigger. So a has something to do with the size of our shape. Then we can do the same thing for B, but we can pass in mouse Y. So as I move along the x-axis, the circle gets bigger. And then as I move along the y-axis, hmm, nothing seems to be happening. So for whatever reason, B isn't affecting anything right now. Well, let's try changing this value of 0 to a 1 for M. And now let's try running it. Now as I move along the x-axis, we get this interesting kind of curled shape. And changing A seems to influence the bottom of the shape, while if I move my mouse up and down, and I'm changing B now, it influences the top of the shape more. So you can see we kind of get this interesting oscillating effect if we move our mouse around, which is pretty cool. Uh, what happens if we increase M even more, like to 6? Wow, now we get a much more interesting shape. Uh, and it seems like we have these little spikes that are being affected as I move my mouse around. So as I move my mouse left and right, it looks like three of the spikes are being affected. And then if I move my mouse up and down, the size of the other three spikes are affected. So we're starting to kind of get a better intuition for what these values of A and B actually do. Uh, furthermore, you can see that there's six spikes which corresponds to this number 6 here. And if I increase this again to 10, well, what do you know? Now there's 10 little spikes. So this value of m determines the amount of rotational symmetry of our shape. If we have a lower value, like 2, then we'll get a shape like this, like a kind of a teardrop type shape. If we have a higher value, then we get more of like a sunburst type shape. Okay, well, let's set M to 6, and let's set A and B to 2. And now let's focus on these bottom three values. What happens if we change this value of N1? So now as I move my mouse from left to right, you can see larger values of N1 kind of smooth out the shape. They make it converge closer to a circle while smaller values of N1 make the shape spikier. Uh, 
it make it more pointy. And actually, as N1 approaches zero, it kind of blows the shape up, and it gets really, really big. We can't even see it anymore. So that's what this value of N1 does. It kind of determines like the smoothness versus the spikiness of the shape. Okay, well, let's, that's cool. Let's leave N1 at, at 1. And now let's play around with these N2 and N3 parameters. So let's pass in mouse X divided by 100 for N2. And let's pass in mouse Y divided by 100 for N3. I should mention the reason why I'm dividing by 100 is uh, the mouse X and mouse Y values can vary wildly as I move my mouse, right? We have a size of 500 by 500, which are pretty large values to be passing in as parameters to the super formula. So I'm just scaling it down uh, so that it doesn't change as drastically as I move my mouse. Okay, so let's see how N2 and N3 change. Now I think it starts to get really cool because N2 and N3 help determine the actual shape of these spikes. Uh, and as you can see, as I move my mouse left to right, it changes kind of one set of spikes or one set of sides. And as I move my mouse up and down, it kind of changes the other side. Uh, and so if I move my mouse kind of in a circle like this, again, we get this really cool oscillating effect. Wouldn't it be cool though, if we could animate this without having to move our mouse. So let's do that. That's the next step. In order to do that, I'm going to add a, a variable outside of my draw function called t. And then at the end of my draw function, the very last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to increment t by a small interval. We can start with 0.1. Now I can use functions of t to animate these parameters inside of my super formula. So for example, rather than passing in mouse x divided by 100, I could pass in t. And, and what that's going to do is it's just going to keep increasing n2. And if we pass in uh, t for n3, it'll keep increasing n3 as time goes on. So we can run that. And it's kind of cool, but n2 and n3 just go off to infinity. Well, what we really want to do maybe is to oscillate these values. And in order to oscillate these values, we can use sines and cosines. So let's actually call sine of t and pass that in for n2 and call cosine of t for n3. I'm choosing just arbitrarily to use sine and cosine. You can play around with your own formulas and pass them in for these values here. So now we're starting to get somewhere. I think this looks a lot cooler. You can see that our shape gets pretty small, uh, and that has to do with the values that are spit out by sine and cosine. They range from negative 1 to 1. And so we can just add a small amount uh, to our sine and our cosine value to keep the shape from getting that small. Uh, and furthermore, I'm actually going to scale the value also by 0.5 for both my sine and my cosine. Uh, and so now we can run this, and the shape kind of stays within a certain range of sizes, but it has this interesting oscillating pattern. Well, that's all I'm going to show you in this video. I encourage you to play around with animating more of these parameters. You can use sines and cosines with this t value and start passing them in for a and for b or for m and n1 and get lots of cool animations. If you find any cool animations yourself or any interesting parameters to pass in to the super formula, please leave them uh, as YouTube comments. I'd love to see them. Thanks for watching.